as most of you probably know by now, I'm Skylar with Lean Frontiers. And we have on our screen, Pat Geary and Oscar Roche. And they will be facilitating the webinar today. And Oscar and Pat, I believe you are good to go. Excellent. Thanks, Skylar. And once again, as always, Lean Frontiers, thank you very much for putting this together. And Pat, thanks again for giving us your time for this um, for this half hour. So Pat Geary is the Chief Operating Officer of Story Construction that are based in the, uh, Ames, Iowa. Pat, very quickly, just in a minute, who is Story and what do they do? Sure. So we're a, a general contractor. We've been in business 90 years um, here within in a couple of years. Uh, we do work within about 100 miles of Ames. Uh, 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 schools, industrial work, offices, um, uh, do some light manufacturing, do some uh, water and wastewater treatment. About $125 million worth of work a year. Uh, we're 150 people. Um, we have um, our supervisory staff. We also have uh, crafts people who do steel and concrete and precast and carpentry. So kind of the typical Midwest um, uh, general contractor. Good. <clears throat> no, thanks, Pat. Now, this is a follow on webinar really from July 28, where we had a number of questions submitted and we only got through some of them. So let's get straight into one from last webinar. And that was from Andrew Paris. And he said, he asked, how do you get people at the, I'll let, I should introduce the point, sorry, that, that, that your story construction is embedding scientific thinking in much of the leadership activities, much of the leadership tasks, many of the leadership functions. So uh, that's an important point here. And Andrew Paris asks, how do you get people at the lowest levels, the lowest levels in the hierarchy, also involved in lean and CI? So um, <clears throat> about four years ago, we, um, we modified the routine uh, where our, our crews uh, start and, and end the day. Uh, we had a, uh, a routine meeting that helped them start the day and we, we modified uh, that routine and added an ended end of shift uh, discussion as well. And we created, a, we created a board that really embedded the uh, the scientific thinking um, steps. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, what do we accomplish today? What do we learn from an experiment we, we were trying today? Um, and we we're working into this routine uh, daily observations and we're, we're experimenting with how to teach our people to observe the work, to have them have a, a more robust conversation um, in the afternoon. So beginning of the day is really, what are we gonna do? Uh, what's the experiment for the day? Uh, we, we take some observations and then we talk about how did it go today? What did we learn? Uh, what, what different actions might we take tomorrow to, to improve the, the production goals we have? And so <clears throat> we, um, we shared with them what the routine was. We didn't make a big um, production out of uh, teaching them all of the elements of the improvement routine. It, we wanted to be have it be more subtle and have them get into the practice of doing it, and then we'll follow on with uh, some more of the explanation of really what we're trying to accomplish uh, with it. Uh, we found that being subtle and starting things has been a whole lot more effective in deploying new new elements of um, of our lean journey than than making a big um, uh, kind of big production out of it and just tends to intimidate people. I think that ties in with something you've said to me last week when I was there or the previous, you said, we, we tend to introduce things without fanfare. Then afterwards we say, oh, by the way, can you just, I think that's what you're leading to there. Can you just explain that a little further? Yeah. Um, so we've been on this journey for nine years now and uh, we've learned, uh, we've learned better how to deploy things. And in the early years, we would, we would be very, um, um, I guess excitable and rambunctious, and and lots of uh, lots of fanfare about uh, adding elements to our to our program. And we we found that when we did that, uh, we got people uncomfortable. It's not that they were disagreed with what probably our premise was or what we were trying to accomplish, but but it just all of the energy we had wasn't helpful. And so we've we've gone to a much more low key. 
uh, introduce it small pieces at a time, introduce it at, at individual locations, um, and simply let them let them experiment with it. And uh, we've seen groups take off in a in a in a big way. And and one of the things we're finding is the the energy energy of the discoverer is overcoming the resistance to change. And so when we don't make it a big deal, and simply simply help educate them and coach them and give them give them some latitude to go do some things. Uh, they go a, a lot more quickly than they would have had we um, uh, made a big production out of it. Sure. That's, that's, it's been a it's been a change over the nine years of how we're, we're we're deploying different things. Pat, because of the work I've done with you, I've got a um, a picture of that board, so I'm just going to bring that up to you, yep. which you, people should be able to share on this. screen. you just want to? This is the version four from six months ago, so I know it's changed. Again, but do you want to just give people a quick overview of what that is and what you were talking about? Yeah, so th this right-hand column is really where we um, talk about what we're going to do today. And so what are the goals we're going to accomplish? What are the production goals that, that meet the production plan? The right or the left? Uh, the on the left. You probably can't see yes. my, my mouse. Um, and then we then break it down into specific quantities of work we want to accomplish. You know what kind of PPE and and tools and materials and equipment do we need for that? You know how it might interact with other trades, and then then we get into what what are we going to try differently today than we than we did yesterday? What what's an experiment we want to try? And it, it doesn't need to be particularly large, but let's try to do something differently today and see and see what we learn. Um, we're we're getting uh, trying to get people in the routine habit of then observing that experiment. Uh, that can be that's been a that's been a challenge, um, and then at the end of the day, we then bring them in and have a discussion. That's really the middle and and right columns about what do we get done, uh, what did we learn by the experiment, uh, what actions uh, do we think we can take tomorrow to um, to try to improve what we're doing, uh, what opportunities are within it. Um, some of the text on the bottom, we've you know we've got. Some actions to improve. We've got some. We've got some oh, waste uh, waste items. And when we first um, rolled it out, we actually called the items uh, um, waste factors, uh, not just similar to what, what Toyota would. We found that our people um, uh, felt bad, as if they had done something wrong when they were talking about about one of those items. And so we've simply changed it to opportunities to improve. We haven't really changed the text or the nature of what the, the item is we simply retitled it from kind of a glass half empty to a glass half full uh, vocabulary and now they're happy to talk about it because it doesn't it doesn't feel like they've done something wrong uh, thanks thanks for that overview uh, Andrew also asked at the end of that question he said do you have uh, hiring criteria around lean or CI when you bring on new people uh, no um, uh, we'd love to to have that within construction. There's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot, a lot of lean practice. There is certainly some um, that, that tends to be more at the job level. The, the board you saw is really more at the craft level. Um, and so we've you know we've um, we understood that we need to teach it. Again, we've been doing the things for five or for nine years. Half of our staff has been with us five years or less, and so. Uh, every day we get to the point where a higher and higher percentage of the people at Story have not known Story any other way than than with these um, uh, with these lean practices in place. And so, um, you know, the people who who weren't going to agree with it, they left a long time ago. And so, we don't have a lot of folks that um, uh, are are impediments to the system. Some are more enthusiastic than others, certainly, but. Um, you know, when we get into some of our superintendents and our manager level, uh, some of that lean experience is helpful, but because uh, there are some other lean programs out there, um, what that tends to not include that we do is, is a bit of a cultural uh, piece. Uh, our lean practice is about, uh, about low tech, high collaboration. And, um, you know, we, we've, we believe that none of us is as smart as all of us. If you know, if we can find one smart person in the group and get that person to contribute, uh, the whole group can succeed. And so the 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 you know our our boards and our our process is about getting all of the people engaged um, in a safe place. Sure. 
from our subcontractors to our crews to our supervisors to and then all across the company this uh, lean lean shows up in all of the all the elements of the company yeah i think the key thing you said there and certainly something i observed is it's it's very you have very much a cultural view of lean rather than a task view um Stephen Best, and this ties in, Stephen Best has asked, what is the largest barrier to building the habit of daily improvement into everyone's routine? And that sort of ties back to that board. So what's the largest barrier to building the habit of daily routine into uh, daily improvement into everyone's routine? Uh, just their old habits. It's, you know, changing <laughs> habits is, is hard. Um, and we've had to, um, we've had to learn how to help people change habits. And I, I mentioned that the that the energy of the discoverer overcomes the resistance to change, and that's that is becoming the the the, the mechanism by which we're getting people to change. Is we're we need to have them discover that this is good for them, as opposed to simply being told that it's good for them. Uh, they'll believe us, and they'll they'll go along with us to a point. But when when things get get stressful or get um, you know, tempers get up or whatever, they'll go back to, to past habits. And so again, being subtle and introducing things in small pieces, um, you know, eating them elephant one bite at a time, uh, but really giving them the opportunity to discover on themselves and to, uh, we give them the framework to live in and allow them to do, do their activities in the way that they believe is best. And so we, we're going to be very prescriptive about some things, but then offer complete freedom with other things. And, and, um, and the idea is that we, our process is the same everywhere. The answers that it yields can be completely different. Sure. No. And, and the, the, thank you. Mike, uh, Mike Bukowski has asked, and we sort of touched on this already, but maybe you want to expand a little further. He said, what level of standardization in your daily operating system do you maintain across different sites, different projects? Yeah, so we have... Um, um, we, we kind of have it at two levels. We have the overall project level, and then we have it at our, at our craft, at our crew level. And we have uh, uh, fairly rigid standards around um, a series of meetings and a series of activities that, that help the, the project plan and schedule, and then how our crews go through their daily routine. Um, we have engaged Oscar actually over the last 18 months or so to examine some of the elements of those of those programs and and have started to write work standards around um, around some of those elements. We have a, a, a manual, if you will, that does set standards. Um, it's not done to the point that we're doing in the work standards activities. And so um, we will continue with that. Um, ultimately, we want to get to the point here in the next year with Oscar's help where we have um, uh, we have people trained to be able to lead that work standard work. Um, but what we found with, I mean, our goal is that, it, that every site uh, operates similarly. And, and we believe we were generally doing that, but COVID actually um, proved that to us a bit. Uh, it wasn't unusual in, for us to call the superintendent and say, hey, you've been exposed or you're sick or whatever, you need to go home for two weeks. And if the job was in his head and he was kind of building it in his own style, um, all that knowledge goes with him when he goes home or goes to the, the hospital or whatever it might've been. With the system, we could send a new person in, they would look at our boards, they'd walk the job, they talk to a few people. And because the system is collaborative, all of the other leaders on that site really just kept going. And they just needed somebody to kind of, you know, uh, direct traffic a little bit, but that new superintendent could just keep the project moving forward, even though he didn't really know all that much about the job. So that the consistency job to job where he just understood what time meetings were, what the meeting was going to be, what we're going to talk about, all of that, let that person step right in and, and, and just keep the project moving forward. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I, I noticed it's come up in the Q&A, and this is going to be your favorite question based on discussions we've had over the last month. Um, uh, Ashok Motwani has asked, how is tack time, how is tack time used in construction industry while working on turnkey projects, while working on projects? So I know yeah, this is so, going to be something you will like to talk about. Yeah, we're, um, so we're, we're just in the throes of trying to weave that into uh, what we're doing in a much, in a much greater way. Um, 
tack is a word that is um, kind of foreign to us. We obviously uh, all projects need to be completed at a certain pace to make sure they get done at the at, at the time the project needs to be done. And so um, there's an element in our system of of where we try to bring crews together and, and illustrate how work flows through space and time. And that. And we're, we're finding we need, we need to say, send uh, or, or establish a, a specific pace of that work or attack. And we try to bundle work areas or work zones into about a week's worth of work for each crew. And, that, and so that may vary in size um, of work zone, depending on what that crew is. But we try to get a rhythm of about a week's worth of work in a chunk, which allows them then to break it down into individual daily tasks. Um, we've come to realize that cycle times within an individual crew in a work zone can vary from a week, but the overall uh, pace of the project that often gets led by uh, kind of the, the main trades, a framing trade or a masonry trade, they kind of set the pace. And so we, we establish their pace um, and then let the other, tr other trades uh, work when, inside that tack, even though their particular cycle times might be might be faster than whenever that particular trade is, but it's um, it's necessary. We're formalizing it in a way that's making our people a little uncomfortable right now, but but we'll get there. So yeah, I think and an interesting thing happened last week. Um, I think you know one of the sessions we were at uh, where where this topic of tack time came up. The box, um, the little thing I had on the flip chart, we um, the little box there was left empty. And I remember when you walked out the door, you said, I think I've said enough. I won't be here later in the week. And I said, no problem. We'll see how we go. And then on, when I came in and saw you on Thursday, I said, by the way, that box now has something written in it. Yep. And you said, that's terrific. And I think that's the essence of what uh, the way I've seen you lead. Can you just talk a little bit about that? If you were to jam tack time down their throat, uh, it's not going to stick. So why did you say to me, well, if you've got something written in that box, that's that's terrific. You didn't well, say what's been written. What amused me was you didn't say to me, what did they write there? It was just you were you were pleased that something was now written in that box. Yeah. So this this so you know, my part of that discussion was simply talk about uh, why it was important, how how it can be used and how we how we believe it's necessary as we develop uh, develop our pieces. And so, um, and, and they understood that. So as long as they understood it, then they've got the parameters. Now, how do they solve that issue? How do they come up with something that works for them? And this is, again, they're discovering how it's gonna work for them. And, it, and mm. I won't need to press it um, for them to do it because it's really what they've come up with. Now, if they get completely out of bounds with it, sure, we can bring them back. But, but again, if we establish kind of what's important, uh, what are the, you know, what are the, what are the principles and philosophies we're trying to um, uh, to instill and use, and then let people work inside that? That's um, I think everybody gets what they want. We get the, 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 the philosophies and principles, and they get to be able to um, uh, create their own work processes that, uh, that achieve that. And sure. you know, our our yeah, dilemma the... is 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 with, when this team kind of really figures it out. How do we get it to the next team? <laughs> um, without having them to have to discover everything, uh, but not not forcing that on them either. So we're um, that board that you showed. We've actually got the newest version that we had two different teams work on improving, and so now we're going to blend both of those improvements together and, and return that back to both of those teams and see how how they react to seeing their stuff on there, but somebody else's. And and we're experimenting right now with with using that, and and so we're experimenting with how do we deploy learning um, as opposed yeah, to just having to well said. all learning by everybody all the time. So, Yeah, well said. The other thing that I, I don't know if I said to you that amused me about it is that when we were talking about that, populating that box, um, I said, you know, why do we need to discuss this? And they all, one of them looked at me and grinned and said, because Pat wants us to. And I, and I picked up on that and said, well, that's true. But why does Pat want you to? And after I asked about three or four, why does he want that? Why we got they knew, they knew exactly why, and they trusted you, and they knew that they need to get there, <clears throat> and they can see the importance of it. And I think that's a really important learning there is that someone at your level sets the intent, 
sets the intent and, intent and establishes the why uh, and then allows the crew level people to discover how they're going to do it. And I think yeah. that's, that's key to what you're doing. And I see that a lot in the way you conduct yourself um, and the way you, you, know, you way the, you lead this intent, if you like. Yeah. And it, I mean, that was a learned thing. Um, I, I wish I could say I, that was always the way I've been. That's not, that's not true. I've, I've learned um, the more I press, the harder it is. And the less <laughs> I press, the easier it is. And so I wish I had to figure that out 15 years ago, but at least yeah. I got there eventually. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, um, this is solid stuff. Um, and so smart people will listen and hear it and, and say, yeah, that makes sense. And so just get them and get them on the road, get, put the barriers up, barriers up and then let them go. And, and they'll, they'll do great stuff. They'll way better stuff than we could dream up. And so, yes, so exactly. let's get out of the way. Yeah. Good. Um, I, I was very, yeah, I, I had a lot of learning from that experience, which was great. So um, the other thing, and you've touched on it a little bit, last week, we brought together the principles of standard work, or work standards, sorry. We brought together the principles of work standards and Carter coaching with a group of coaches. Uh, when you brought this up with me about three months ago, um, you were way ahead of me as to what you thought was going to happen. I didn't, hadn't connected the two and it took me a while to think that through. But uh, we did it last week, and what was what did you see happen during that exercise? Because you were there for both the, all sessions. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that be maybe long would answer. One of the things we're trying to do is to create a story way. And you've got the Toyota way, and and they've got all the things they do, and we're we're, we're trying to draw elements from Toyota and from Lean to make it our way, and so. Um, you know, I've been to several Katakans and they're excellent. And, and, and Mike is laid out in, in great detail and, and well-written kind of what, what uh, the improvement routine is, what the coaching routine is. And so, so like I said, you just, we can't just take and just jam down someone's throat uh, what somebody else said to do. And so I said, how do we create a standard, a story standard for, uh, for coaching, um, for the coaching routine or coaching of the improvement routine. And so we got guys, um, so we've been working with coaching here for about three years and we started making some of our own coaches because we didn't really have any. And, um, and so we brought some guys that had done that and some guys that, that really hadn't done it. And so you know, you did a, a good job of educating them, uh, of demonstrating kind of the, how, you, how you coach. Um, one of our guys wanted a very direct answer and, and Oscar turned around and simply asked, started asking more questions. And, and the individual got to, he had the answer within him. And so um, that group um, started to understand that the role of a coach is not to provide answers, but simply to ask the next question. And um, our habit is to have a problem come and immediately provide the answer. And when we do that, we always have to then be available to give the answer. How do we grow people up more quickly? How do we grow people up to be able to, 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 to tackle new situations? We need to teach a, a methodology of thinking. And um, it's really about being curious, asking questions, uh, being curious about what's going on and why, uh, taking a, mo a moment to reflect on what's happening so we can make a better decision going forward. And the transformation in the group was to, to realize that this is not about providing answers, but about asking the next question. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that was one of the, um, yeah, that was, re that was re emphasized for me. Um, yeah, that was re emphasized for me last week for sure. Um, Ashok has asked another question, and it's a bit more technical. And he's talking about tack time calculated by trade per week versus tack time for the full project. You're focused more on uh, initially anyway, tack time calculated by trade per week. Is that right? That's where your so initial the, focus that, is that going. Was that the initial tack, yeah, is yes. uh, what's the pace of the project? Um, we also ask um, each crew to tell us <clears> specifically <throat> what they're gonna do every day and exactly how much work they're going to get. And so get done that day. And so there's, 
there's a daily cycle time, I'll say, that needs to support the overall tack time um, of an individual uh, operation. And so, again, a job has a kind of a, a, a general driving tact that then needs to be supported. And oftentimes, it's going to be different cycle times. Um, you know, a week's worth of work for one crew may only take a couple of days. It may take all five days for another crew. And so we'll set it based on kind of the driving crew and let the other ones then and then support it um, after that. Occasionally we get into a project. Um, we did a couple of dormitory remodels here in, in at Iowa State, where we basically re just remodeled this, um, all of the dorms in a, in a tower or all the dorm rooms. And so we had um, 272 rooms that we did exactly the same thing. And before we bid that job, we set the tack, it was nine rooms a day. So every trade needed to staff their, their work to get their work done. So one step needed to happen oh, yeah. in nine rooms and, and then they moved on to the next nine. So we set it and after two cycles, the crews adjusted their, their crew sizes and, and then it, it, just, it just flowed. Um, that doesn't happen all that often. Our, our work tends to be much more unique in what happens day to day or week to week than, than that project. But, but we were able to see it really happen there um, in kind of the, the um, perfect scenario. And so now we're trying to draw that into um, more, more one-time work or unique work that happens on most projects. But I think that's an important thing, you know, you, you know, don't start these new concepts, don't start them in the hardest place, right. start them in the easiest place and see what you learn from that and and then go a little bit harder and a little bit harder. I think that's, and that's what, that's the way I see you guys think is that's that scientific approach, scientific thinking approach. Let's see what we can learn on a reasonably easy playing field, relatively easy, and then let's take that learning to, and if you do that for over time, you're going to get there. And that's what I see you guys doing very effectively. Yes. So we've really, in nine years, we've changed our approach from starting things everywhere at once to switching it and just starting it at one or two places and see what we learn. And then, exactly. and then we've got a couple of jobs that are kind of the tip of our, our learning spear. And they, they will just do things because they're just kind of that way. And then we can filter it out other places. And so... Um, it's taken some, um, uh, we've had to change kind of what we see as success because uh, the implementation in the past was get it out there. That was success. And we've changed it now to what are we learning? And, and, and we are getting farther in topics more quickly. It just isn't as broad. And so uh, we'll get there, but um, I'd rather have more learning then less learning and be more broad. If we have more learning, yes. we got we got better chances to be, to find better ideas. Sure. Just to finish, because our time's just about up. Andrew Paris again. He's he's raised this point. <clears throat> While we call PDCA a, and I'm reading down a three two out of cut of problem solving scientific thinking isn't creative art also essential to lean CI. Now I want to just share something on my screen, um, and there's no real answer to this, error, uh, Andrew. But this is this this statement here is from Ed Shine about the difference between skill and art, and I thought this might be of of interest. He says skill is the capacity you have to think scientifically. The art is knowing when to do it. So skill is the capacity you have to think scientifically. He's put it in a different context. I've altered the words a little bit. The art is knowing when to do it and having the appropriate attitude at those moments rather than just exercising a skill in a rote way. And I think that was really important based on what Pat just said. His illustration of this is beautiful. I love it below. He says, it reminds me of what a teacher of painting told my wife and me some time ago. His students were very skillful, but they had nothing to say. We all have many skills, but how we use them goes back to attitude and impulse. And I really love that. And I think that sort of tied in with what you were saying then about, you know, when do we, when we can all have the skill, but when we use it and how it evolves is, uh, is the art part of it, if you like. And I don't know if that helps you, Andrew, but I thought that might be relevant and a good point to finish on. Yeah. Real quick, what I'd say, Oscar, is, is if you have, the skill of thinking, then the creativity can come in the solution. Yeah, right. Okay. It allows, well said. It allows to don't be trapped by paradigms. Let's just try it. Let's just let's see what happens. And that yeah. 
and then and then take it take it from there. And so I think you get um, it's I, I tell folks all the time I'm talking on both sides of my mouth. I'm gonna tell you exactly what to want, want you to do, and I'm not gonna tell you the answer. You'll figure it out. And so <laughs> it um, and and once they try it, yep, they get it, and and um, and. And, and we're making great strides. We got lots, long way to go, lots more to learn, but but it's 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 been a, a neat journey so far. Good. Pat, thanks again. Really appreciate your time. I enjoyed these discussions and I hope that people, and I trust that the people who are watching and watch the recording do as well. I very much appreciate it. Skylar, you just want to uh, close out? Yes. So thank you to everybody who attended today's session. Thank you again to Pat and Oscar. Um, quick reminder that Pat will be at the Cotta Summit coming up in um, March. And actually, Oscar, I believe you'll be there as well. So if you want to talk to both of them one on one, you are more than welcome to come to the summit. Also, you will receive a recording to this webinar within 24 to 48 hours, and it will be coming from me. So that is all I have. We will see you all later. Thanks, Scarlett. Thanks again, Pat. Bye-bye.